नमस्कार गुड इवनिंग आई फील ऑनर्ड एंड प्रिविलेज्ड कोऑर्डिनेट फर्स्ट मास्टर क्लास ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय इंडियन सोसाइटी ऑफ हिमेटोलॉजी एंड ब्लड ट्रांसफ्यूजन द मिशन ऑफ आईएसएचबीटी इज टू प्रमोट एक्सीलेंस इन पेशेंट केयर रिसर्च एंड एजुकेशन इन द फील्ड ऑफ हिमेटोलॉजी एंड दिस इज एन एक्सटेंशन ऑफ द सेम मिशन this master class is being organized for post graduates of field of medicine pediatrics pathology laboratory medicine and transfusion medicine and uh, i would invite president ishbt dr h p pati sir is retired professor from department of hematology all india institute of medical sciences new delhi over to sir Uh, dear friends the virtual master class in hematology is a venture of uh, academic venture of uh, issbt and uh, it is actually the the secretary dr uh, uh, maitri vadacharya it is her uh, brain child and she brought this and we all uh, overwhelmingly accepted and uh, because uh, it is really a need of the hour as per and it will help our post graduate uh, students throughout india and they will be academically benefited because uh, the the the, their, the teachers will be again from throughout india and uh, that will be a very big uh, plus point and again this will be also an interactive uh, program so you can uh, clarify your doubts at the end of the talk and uh, uh, i wish a uh, great success of uh, this academic uh, activity program thank you thank you sir yeah. now i request dr mitrai bhattacharya honorary secretary ishbt say a few words ma'am is director institute of hematology and transfusion medicine kolkata over to ma'am good evening to all the faculties present here and to all the students like uh, this class is basically uh, meant for all the post graduate students only uh, from pathology medicine pediatrics and other uh, transfusion medicine other strings also so uh, we realize that hematology is not there in each and every medical college of uh, india so just to give them help them help the students to have a clear idea about the hematological problem we plan to start this master class so students this is a class for you people so clear your doubt whatever question you have the teacher will uh, clear your doubts and you can uh, suggest your topic also which you need a, a, a class on that topic the, that option is there in the website also so i welcome uh, all the students to this class and hope this will be uh, uh, enjoyable class and also will help you to have some idea about the hematological problems so uh, thank you again for joining this class thank you ma'am i i request dr r k jena honorary secretary indian college of hematology say a few words about the master class sir is professor and head department of hematology at uh, scb medical college odisha over to sir okay good evening friends and colleagues and post graduates the master class in uh, hematology what good initiative by indian society of hematology i must congratulate professor maitri bhattacharya for conceiving this innovative idea and all the office bearers of uh, issbt and president professor pati for uh, making it possible i am sure it is going to generate lot of interest and excitement among the uh, uh, post graduates of uh, the, our country you know the indian society of hematology this year under the leadership of uh, our president professor pati Uh, honorary secretary and the president elect uh, dr sahana and all other office bearers in the front uh, in the really front in organizing lot of academic activities through isbt master class indian college of hematology and so on i am sure it is going to create a tremendous amount of interest among not only the post graduates young hematologists and others even among the public in creating an awareness and generating interest in the field of hematology on behalf of indian society of hematology i welcome all the postgraduates 
Good is very interesting, Master, because I am sure it's going to create a very great success and interest among the postgraduates. I wish all the success for this program. Over to Abhishek, please. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Shanaz Khodaizi, President Elect ISHBT, to say a few words first about Master Class. Ma'am is consultant hematology and transfusion medicine at PD Hinduja Hospital and Medical Research Center, Mumbai. Ma'am has dual role today. Ma'am will also be taking first master class. Over to Ma'am. Good evening, everyone, my colleagues, students. Uh, before I begin, I would like to uh, congratulate Dr. Maitri on this great initiative and ISHBT for coming forward and organizing a, this masterclass so fast. We all put our heads together and decided on some initial few programs and it's going to be very beneficial to all the postgraduates and especially those doing their uh, post-graduation in medicine because as uh, someone rightly said, hematology is not uh, very extensively taught in any of the lectures. So in fact, I have even urged the students from my institute to attend all the master classes. It will be hugely beneficial to them. And I also am greatly honored that I've been invited to talk at this first master class. And I'm going to uh, talk on uh, approach to anemia. It's correctly the first topic in any hematology uh, uh, academic session should be on anemias because it's so extensive and so difficult even today to di correctly diagnose anemias. So I begin with my talk on uh, approach to anemias. Now, anemia is one of the most commonly encountered conditions that we see in clinical practice. It is estimated that about 6% of the US population is affected with, an with anemia and about 10 million new cases of anemia are seen every year in India, and it affects about 50 to 60 percent of our population. Now, by definition, anemia is the decrease in the number of red blood cells or hemoglobin content resulting in reduced oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. This results in decreased oxygen, which is transported to tissues, causing end organ damage. Therefore, it has to be diagnosed and treated early. Measurement of total RPC mass requires special radio labeling techniques, which are not routinely possible, very time consuming, labor intensive. Therefore, we come up with the most pragmatic definition of anemia, which is a hemoglobin level below lower limit of normal range for the age and sex of the individual. And the most popularly used reference range is the one which is published by WHO, in which anemia is said to exist if the hemoglobin is less than 13 grams per delta liter in an adult male, less than 12 grams per delta liter in a non-pregnant adult female, less than 11 grams per delta liter in pregnant females and in children from six to six months to six years of age, and below 12 grams per delta liter in children from six to 14 years of age. Beyond 14 years, they start following the normal adult ranges. Now, evaluation of anemia is a huge challenge and the treatment of anemia depends on the correctness and the promptness of the diagnosis. Therefore, lab plays a major role in the diagnosis of anemias. First and foremost, in any patient of anemia, we proceed to first establish that the patient has an anemia and then we proceed to find the cause of that anemia because anemia by itself is not a diagnosis, but it is a manifestation of some underlying disorder. Thus, even if you have mild asymptomatic anemia, which you have just picked up on a routine examination, it should be investigated so that the primary problem can be diagnosed and treated. And here I can say that lab parameters are more useful than clinical findings for the approach of the diagnosis of anemias because lab findings are quite nonspecific because the common symptoms in anemia will be very nonspecific, such as dyspnea on exertion, easy fatigability, palpitation, faintness, giddiness, sometimes headaches, tinnitus, lack of concentration, drowsiness patient can come with any of these or if the patient has some dark urine jaundice excess menstrual bleeding etc you can say that these are the cause of anemia history is very important 
in all cases of anemia, onset, the duration of that anemia is important, whether it's acute, like a blood loss anemia, or it is a chronic anemia occurring from a long period of time. Family history is very important to rule out some genetic anemias. Diet, history of weight loss may be associated with malignancies, change in stool habits, bleeding, such as menstrual bleeding, fever, jaundice, dark urine, all these will point towards certain conditions and therefore a good history taking is very important. Clinically, the patient comes with pallor, ictris, sometimes you can find lymph nodes enlarged, sometimes liver spleen is enlarged, you can see bruises if the platelet counts are low and certain anemia is associated with low uh, turnover in the bone marrow or aplastic anemia type of situations or leukemia type of situations. And you can even find hemic murmurs. And less commonly, if the anemia is advanced, the patient can be in CCF also. So the severity of the symptoms depend more on the duration than on the severity of the anemia. Now, the classification of anemia is based on multiple parameters. First is on the morphological or cytometric uh, findings that depends on the cell size and the hemoglobin content of the red blood cell. Second classification is erythrokinetic, which depends on the rate of the RBC turnover, whether there is more production of RBCs in the marrow or less production. And third is the biochemical classification, which depends on any factor that is depleted, any factor that is required for synthesis of the red blood cells, and that is lacking or, or, or absent, and the anemia is caused by that. So these are the three types of classifications of anemia and mostly we combine all three when we come to a, some diagnosis or some conclusion of anemias. Now, based on the morphological or cytometric or cell size of the anemias, we find anemias which have, which, which have a normal MCV of 77 to say 95 femtoliters, varying a little bit here and there depending on the population. So these anemias which have a normal MCV and MCH can be anemia of chronic disease, hemolytic anemias, hemorrhagic anemias, or aplastic anemias. Anemias with a low MCV can be iron deficiency, thalassemia, and some long-standing cases of chronic disease anemias also can have additional iron deficiency and sideroblastic anemias. And you have those in which the MCV is more than 95 femtoliters. This you will commonly find in nutritional deficiency such as B12 folic acid and Sometimes MCV is raised also in reticulocytes, which appear as big cells. And so you can see them as macrocytes in the peripheral blood. So you have to be careful to distinguish this from the actual macrocytic anemias. And it is commonly seen in hematological malignancies. The erythrokinetic anemias are based on the rate of the RPC turnover. Therefore, they may be a hyper regenerative, where the turnover is high, which is commonly seen in hemolysis or hemorrhage. The marrow, in these cases, the marrow steps up the production of the RBCs, which are released prematurely from the bloodstream. Then you have marrows which, do, which are hyporegenerative, which are hypocellular marrows due to inadequate marrow response to the anemia. This, in these cases, you will see that the reticulocyte count is reduced. And classic examples of these are aplastic anemia and primary marrow failure syndromes. The distinction of these categories is not always so clear cut. Sometimes there is an overlap. For instance, in thalassemia major, you may see a hemolysis occurring along with inadequate marrow response. So you can see an overlap here. The biochemical classification of anemias, in these the biochemical tests identify a depleted substance which is necessary for hematopoiesis such as iron B12. The depleted factor, you can assay it also. In nutritional anemias and iron, defici iron deficiency anemias and B12 folic acid defici deficiency, this is easy. But in aplastic anemias, there is no biochemical mechanism and therefore you will be at a loss if you are depending on just the biochemical class classification. Now, an abnormally functioning enzyme such as G6PD or pyruvate kinase may be reduced and this is easy also to measure. The commonly used tests or ordered tests for the diagnosis of anemias are listed here. The most important and the mainstay of diagnosis of all anemias is the CBC followed by the reticulocyte count, then the peripheral smear examination, routine biochemical tests along with other 
more sophisticated biochemical tests such as serum and TIBC, B12, folic acid, etc. You can do a urine analysis to see if there is any uh, hematuria or hemoglobin urea to know whether there's some hemolytic to rule out a hemolytic anemia. And if none of these give you the answer, then you have to go for special tests such as Coombs or Smotic Fragility, HPLC or electrophoresis, G6PD uh, estimation, est uh, demonstration of sickling, PNH, and Finally, if you get nothing, you have to go in for a bone marrow examination. So just now to begin with a stepwise approach to anemias, as I told you, the very first thing is you will take a good proper history. So here I just for demonstration sake have taken this case of a 25 year old lady who comes with complaints of fatigue and loss of concentration on an examination. She has pallor. Here we see her CBC findings. What do they show us? That she has a lower hemog low hemoglobin of 7.1 and a low MCV with a RDW, which is little raised. Hematocrit. So here the low, M the low hemoglobin and the low hematocrit have established that this patient has an anemia. We do the reticulocyte count in this patient as well. And it, come, it is 1.35% and the reticulocyte production index is 0.4. So this, we can see this reticulocyte response is not as expected for this low level of anemia. And the red cell in, in disease, we can see from, from the CBC, we can establish whether they are microcytic, macrocytic, et cetera. In our patient, we have a microcytic red cell index with a microcytic hypochromic anemia. And the RDW is also very useful in telling us what type of anemia it is. And here the RDW is slightly raised it is 17.2%. So next, what we do is that we've established the patient has a microcytic hypochromic anemia. We go in for a peripheral smear examination. And just to show you that this is a peripheral smear from a normal patient, normal individual, which shows that the red blood cells are well hemoglobinized. That said, there is not much of a central pallor and they're all almost uniform in shape. Whereas this is a smear from a patient with uh, iron deficiency anemia, in which you can see that the central pallor is increased. There's just a rim of hemoglobin around the RBCs, and this denotes that there is loss of iron in these patients. And here you can see typically also in iron deficiency anemia, you can see these elliptocytes, these kind of cells. Many times in iron deficiency, you can see a lot of target cells. So sometimes this can get you confused with the thalassemia trait and in advanced iron deficiency you will see a lot of these ovulocytes and elliptocyte and poikilocyte type of cells. So once you see that you have a microcytic hypochromic anemia you can think of these following conditions iron deficiency, thalassemia trait, some cases of anemia of chronic disease, some blood loss anemias, long-standing ones. The immediate ones will be normocytic normochromic and sideroblastic anemia. Therefore, the three most common causes of microcytic hypochromic anemia, as I told you, are nutritional due to iron deficiency, thalassemia trait, and some anemias of chronic disease. And as I told you, the RDW is a very, very useful parameter, and we use it to distinguish between iron deficiency and thalassemia. It is usually expressed as CV or SD. We normally look at the CV, and it actually tells us the red cell anisocytosis. That is that there are red cells with varying sizes in, in the smear that you're seeing. So some are microcytic, some are normocytic, some may be reticulocytes, which are macrocytic. So that is why you, you have a high RDW in these cases. The normal RDW is 13.4 plus minus 1.2, with the uh, mean being 14.6, or the upper limit being 14.6. Then this, as I told you, is an early indicator of iron deficiency. It will increase in iron deficiency much more than it will in thalassemia, in thalassemia trait. Thalassemia trait, it might even just be normal, not necessary that it increases. Or if it increases, it will increase minimally. So once we've done that, the next investigation, which is very, very necessary for us, is to do the reticulocyte count. But somehow I find that reticulocyte count is a much underutilized test in hematology. People will do reticulocyte count last instead of ordering it earlier along with the CBC because you see it has so many uses and it can actually uh, differentiate between so many different conditions. Of course, manual reticulocyte counts are very good, but they are subject 
to uh, viewer variations and it depends it's very subjective and uh, may not be as accurate as the reticulocyte counts that you see on the hematology analyzers and the advantage of doing a ret automated reticulocyte count is that additionally it will also give you an absolute reticulocyte count and it will give you a reticulocyte production index which is a very very important and useful parameter to show us the whether the, we are dealing with a hyperproliferative anemia or a hypoproliferative anemia and if your rpi is less than 2% in an anemic patient mind you don't not in a normal patient in an anemic patient if your rpi is less than 2% it signifies that the patient is not forming enough red blood cells in the marrow so this is how the automated reticulocyte count will appear and this is our patient in whom the reticulocyte count as i told you is 1.35 the rpi is 0.4 showing that this patient is not producing enough red blood cells in the bone marrow so once you do the reticulocytes you have to see whether what the response is if uh, is the reticulocyte count increased then you can suspect that the patient may have a hemolytic anemia there may be blood loss there may be recovery from iron and b12 deficiency when these patients are given treat treatment this the reticulocyte count starts to grow, go up and in some cases of drug induced anemias you can have a high reticulocyte count reticulocyte count is typically de decreased in nutritional anemia such as iron deficiency megaloblastic it is extremely reduced in aplastic anemia and bone marrow suppression it is low to normal in anemia of chronic disease and in sideroblastic anemias and this is how reticulocytes can appear on the peripheral smear as larger cells than you see normally larger than your rbcs and there is no central pallor and like there is a kind of a grayish staining so and these are reticulocytes as they appear on supravital stains such as brilliant crystal blue or new, new methylene blue so you have now come to the conclusion that your patient is a microcytic hypochromic with a increased rdw and reticulocyte count not so high so you can suspect patient has an iron deficiency so you confirm this by doing some tests one of the important tests to confirm iron deficiency as well as to monitor the patient on therapy is serum ferritin which once again not too many people do so serum ferritin serum iron tibc percent saturation and the soluble transferrin receptor assays are some of the tests that give us a very good uh, clue or information on whether it is absolutely iron deficiency anemia or is it or or a anemia of chronic disease or a mixture of both so in our patient the serum iron was very low 10 micrograms per delta liter tibc was high transferrin saturation saturation was low retic as i already told you was not very high and additionally there is a parameter which appears in the reticulocyte channel of the newer hematology analyzers called red he or red hemoglobin which was low in our patient i will talk about this a little later and the peripheral smear also showed a microcytic hypochromic picture with low mcv high rdw and this is what confirmed that our patient has an iron deficiency anemia now serum ferritin is a very important uh, per, uh, test to be uh, done in iron deficiency anemia cases because it's the earliest biochemical marker which changes in iron deficiency it is also most accurate in the absence of infection but the reference range for men is 24 to 336 micrograms per liter for women it's 11 to 307 micrograms per liter but a value of more than 100 micrograms is considered as adequate stores however it has a huge limitation and that is that it is an acute phase reactant and it will rise in infection and inflammation therefore in anemia in in iron deficiency anemia it may be falsely elevated therefore in our setting it is of limited use and the better marker or the gold standard we could say for iron stores is bone marrow iron however this is a not ideally recommended because it is such an invasive procedure and just to when we have a easily done serum test to do a bone marrow just to see bone marrow stores is i think not uh, not correct in this day and age so 
but the bone marrow iron stores gives us a very good idea of the iron stores which stained by prussian blue reaction and you have a grading system where you can grade here you can see that the, there is bone marrow iron present normal and increased in acd patients here you can see the particles bone marrow particles which do not show any iron 0 to 1 and these may be little more so you can actually grade your bone marrow iron the newer tests which are available to us for diagnosing uh, iron deficiency anemia with great accuracy and for being able to differentiate it from anemia of chronic disease are the soluble transparent receptors which are a truncated form of the transparent receptors and they are seen in the plasma transparent receptors are normally seen on the surface of the erythrocytes erythroid Uh, precursors in the bone marrow and they bind to the iron which is around them in the reticular endothelial cells and they internalize this iron into the erythroid cell so however when iron is not there these are lying free in the plasma and they are increased therefore in iron deficiency they help to distinguish between iron deficiency and acd and they are elevated several fold in iron deficiency but normal in acd they are definitely better markers than ferritin because they are not affected by infection or inflammation and then there is a ratio of the transparent to log ferritin which is also called the transparent ferritin index this provides the highest sensitivity and specificity and should replace conventional parameters of iron status if the ratio is more than 1 to 1.5 you can safely say your patient has iron deficiency if it is less than 1.5 patient is likely to have anemia of chronic disease and now we come to iron deficiency anemia in men which is a completely different entity from iron deficiency anemia in women and children and this is a a low hemoglobin in an adult or young adult male is never seen and if you see a hemoglobin which is 10.8 and a low uh, mcv it definitely warrants further investigation you have to look for some cause of this anemia and it is seen that an increased number of gi lesions in young men with iron deficiency anemia ha have been seen and this suggests that you should go ahead with a colonos colonoscopy in these patients a colonoscopy and an egd are recommended in even asymptomatic young men with iron deficiency anemia as recommended by a recent study now compared with men without iron deficiency anemia asymptomatic young men with iron deficiency anemia have an increased proportion of gastrointestinal issues such as villus adenoma colorectal cancers ibd and gastric ulcers therefore this is one uh, population which should not go uninvestigated and undetected now we come to the next cause of iron deficiency anemia which is a thalassemia trait and typically you will see a hemoglobin in these patients which is not very low and but the mcv is extremely low and the rbc count is very high as you can see over here and the rdw in these patients is just just about normal it's just very very ma marginally increased so this is a from the cbc itself you can get a clue as to what you are uh, what the diagnosis could be could likely be and the next step would be to do a peripheral smear examination where you see microcytic hypochromic cells you see target cells and you typically see uh, cells which show basophilic stippling or punctate basophilia this is more often seen in thalassemia rate than in ids then you go ahead and you do whatever if you have an electrophoresis or if you have an hplc you do hplc and you can see that there is a raised peak in the a2 region the a2 is 5 here you have a2 band which is that goes with the e band it's increased and the menzer index is a rough it's a rough index but i think i it serves fairly well to uh, to assess uh, to to diagnose uh, thalassemia traits and especially when you are not very certain when you've done an hplc and you're getting some uh, borderline values it's good to do a menzer index to find out whether your patient is more likely to be iron deficient or more likely to be a thalassemia trait now some of the newer hematology analyzers have incorporated many many newer parameters which can diagnose iron deficiency much more early than the conventional markers and these are known by different names so you can 
actually have the hemoglobin, measure the hemoglobin in the RBCs, which is the RBC, HE or the CHCM, or you can measure the hemoglobin in the reticulocytes. And here, this is the red HE or the hemoglobin content of reticulocytes. And additionally, these instruments also calculate something called the percent hypo, which is a flow cytometrically measured volume and hemoglobin concentrate of the RBCs. Here, percentage of cells with a hemoglobin concentration of less than 28 picograms per delta liter is defined as hypochromic. And it is whom there are more than 10% hypos hypochromic cells, it correlates with true iron deficiency, whereas 5 to 10% hypo correlates with functional iron deficiency. This is a very good parameter to roughly say, even before your serum iron and TIBC can come, you can directly from the CBC see these values and diagnose what uh, the patient may have. So the reticulocyte hemoglobin equivalent or the red HE or the CHR measures the hemoglobin content of red, freshly produced reticulocytes. That is why it is such a good parameter because the reticulocytes mature in the bone marrow for one to three days and they circulate in the peripheral blood for one to two days more. Therefore, this red HE will measure your hemoglobin available for uh, erythropoiesis in just four days prior to what you're measuring. It reflects the actual ion supply for hemoglobin synthesis in the bone marrow. Advantages are that it is a direct assessment of iron, which is actually used for biosynthesis of the hemoglobin. Your typical biochemical markers are only indicators of iron supply. They just tell you how much iron there is in the body, but they don't really tell you whether that iron will be incorporated or not into the for erythropoiesis or for synthesis of your respiratory enzymes. The conventional hematological parameters, which we have so far been looking at, like MCV, MCH, are only affected at a later stage in iron deficiency because we know that the RBC lifespan is about 80 to 120 days. And only then, once the RBCs are cleared out, will the new RBCs show any change in the situation. Whereas in red HE, within four days, if you are if you, if you are given iron and if it is incorporated within four days, you can see a rise of the red HE, showing that your treatment has worked. The other advantage is that red HE is not affected by inflammation, unlike ferritin. Also useful in monitoring response in CKD patients to erythropoietin and IV iron therapy, and. An increase in red HE indicates that the therapy is acting. The main thing about this parameter is that there is no other such test available. You cannot calculate it manually, and no other such uh, no other test gives you this kind of information. The importance of red HE has been recognized so much that even the guidelines for uh, estimation of anemia in CKD have incorporated measurement of red HE as one of the parameters to diagnose functional iron available for erythropoiesis. And this has been published in the European Best Practice Guidelines. So we established the uh, normal range of red HE in our hospital. And we found that the, in males, it was 28.7 to 34.1 picograms. And in females, it was 27.7 to 33.4 picograms. And because we, all, we had done a study where we compared the sensitivity and specificity of red HE to serum ferritin and serum ion studies to see the effectiveness of this parameter in early diagnosis of iron deficiency. And our results showed that with an ROC of 0.999 and when we employed a cutoff value of 28 picograms for the red HE, we found that below 28 picograms, it was possible to diagnose iron deficiency anemia with a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 97.9%. We found this very useful and we actually use this parameter in our hospital. Now we come to the normocytic normochromic anemias or the hemolytic anemias in which the MCV is normal at 80 to say 100 femtoliters, some People take it as 76 to 95 femtoliters. And there are many overlap anemias in this normocytic normochromic range. However, again, reticulocyte is an important parameter here. If it is increased, if you see a normocytic normochromic anemia with high reticulocyte count, you can safely say it is maybe due to hemolysis or it is a post-hemorrhagic anemia. If the reticulocyte count is normal or low, 
you can be looking at an anemia of chronic disease renal disease liver disease you know any of the chronic conditions bone marrow disorders like aplastic anemia and tourette syndrome etc in anemia of chronic disease i have just taken the cbc from one of our patients who is a 28 year old male who comes to us regularly he is a known case of chronic kidney disease and comes to us for a uh, dialysis here you can see his hemoglobin is very low 5 normally you don't see such a low hemoglobin in acds but in this patient it was very low however the mcv is normal and the reticulocyte the the rdw is 17 slightly raised and the reticulocyte count is reduced much reduced 0.13 and the peripheral smear examination showed a very unremarkable normocytic normochromic type of anemia acd is mostly due to a mild shortening of the red cell life span and there is impaired erythropoiesis because of that there is abnormal iron metabolism there is reduced circulating iron though there is enough iron in the reticular endothelial system the iron stores are a plenty but somehow they do not get incorporated and do not form it do not go into the formation of the red cells because of reduced iron absorption so you can say that there is hypoferemia or less iron in the setting of plenty iron stores are plenty normal or increased but it is not being made available for erythropoiesis lab diagnosis in acd is mainly an anemia which is mild to moderate the rbcs are mainly normocytic normochromic sometimes if it is long standing it they can become microcytosis due to some Uh, nutritional deficiency reticulocyte count is normal or reduced ps is unremarkable bone marrow iron stores are normal or increased and the soluble transport receptor assay is normal serum iron is also normal or may be increased it, this acd is the most common anemia amongst chronically ill patients and clinical features of the primary disorder can be seen rarely low very rarely low hemoglobin is the first sign and you have to work up this patient based on that low hemoglobin mostly the patient will come with the primary disease symptoms and this is just a the chart to show the differential diagnosis of anemia and uh, mainly anemia of chronic disease iron deficiency anemia and thalassemia trait and the important parameters here i would say are the serum ferritin which is reduced in iron deficiency whereas it is increased or normal in anemia of chronic disease and the soluble transferrin receptor assays which are high or increased in iron deficiency whereas normal in anemia of chronic disease now once you have ruled out all these causes causes of uh, microcytic hypochromic anemia you will sometimes find that your patient is still not responding to treatment and you have to look for some other causes some common causes which have been noticed causing uh, microcytic hypochromic anemias are helicobacter pylori infection and the mechanism in this is a reduction in the acid medium of the of the stomach and intestine that is achlorhydria because it is associated because h pylori is associated with chronic gastritis it causes a refractory iron deficiency anemia in the absence of bleeding you can also see an microcytic hypochromic anemia in lead poisoning in gi bleeds as i already told you and there is a condition which is an iron refractory refractory iron deficiency anemia which does not improve with oral iron treatment it is a genetic caused by some genetic defects and the inheritance is autosomal recessive the diagnosis of this anemia is confirmed by genetic testing it is more mainly seen in children and it is seen that it is treated with a trial of oral iron along with the vitamin c it somehow seen that vitamin c helps to absorb the iron and that these patients do become better and if they don't then iv uh, iron will be required in these patients and somehow these patients outgrow this and they become normal as they grow up into adulthood they don't have this and this is just an algorithm of how to interpret uh, iron studies in the back background of an inflammation so if you have an inflammation or an inflammatory condition and you have to say whether your 
uh, patient is iron deficient or ACD, you do a transparent saturation. If your transparent saturation is less than 16%, you do a ferritin. If your ferritin is less than 30%, you know that definitely your patient has an iron deficiency. However, if the, if the ferritin is between 30 to 100 nanograms, you may you don't know whether it has increased due to the infection. So you go ahead and do a soluble transparent receptor assay. If the transparent receptor, uh, uh, the, that index transparent receptor to log ferritin is more than two, you likely your patient has an iron deficiency anemia. And if it is less than one, then your patient has an anemia of chronic disease. Now we come to the macrocytic anemias. Any anemia with a low hemoglobin and an MCV of more than 95 femtoliters is a macrocytic anemia. Macrocytic anemias may be megaloblastic or they may be non-megaloblastic. And this is what the CBC will look like where the MCV is raised, the hemoglobin is the hemoglobin is 12. And your RDW is 15. So to evaluate macrocytic anemias, you have to rule out nutritional causes of vitamin B12 and folic acid deficiency. They, these are the biggest group in which you'll find macrocytic anemias. You have to rule out certain drugs which can cause macrocytosis such as hydroxyurea, methotrexate, etc. Then you have to after ruling out these conditions, you then have to evaluate those anemias which are non-drug induced and non-nutritional macrocytic anemias. The megaloblastic anemias are mainly nutritional. You will see in them a hypersegmented neutrophils are the first sign to develop in vitamin B12 and deficiency anemias. Here the RDW is fairly raised and it helps to distinguish between megaloblastic anemia caused by folate or vitamin B12 deficiency from other causes of macrocytosis. You have oval mac macrocytes in the peripheral smear, you have poikilocytes, fragmented cells, hobble jolly bodies, nucleated red blood cells, cabot rings, all these can be seen in B12 deficiency. Very often we see pancytopenia and low reticulocyte count in these patients and many, very often it can be mistaken or it is mistaken for aplastic anemia. So when you see a pancytopenia with a low retic, don't jump to the conclusion that your patient has aplastic anemia, but first rule out a B12 deficiency. Then the bone marrow shows a hypercellular erythroid hyperplasia and many megaloblasts along with giant myelocytes, metamyelocytes are seen. This is the peripheral smear finding in a case of megaloblastic anemia where you find large macroovalocytes. And poly, this is a hypersegmented uh, neutrophil. And these are megaloblasts seen in the bone marrow with open chromatin and larger cells. So investigation, the, the, the pathogenesis of megaloblastic anemias is that the def deficiency of B12 and folic acid are necessary for DNA synthesis. And when they are reduced, DNA synthesis is retarded. Or it, it can also be due to increased demand such as in cancers because there is in excess production of cells in the bone marrow in these conditions. And therefore, they all compete with each other for getting their share of their DNA and you therefore have larger cells, more immature cells coming out into the circulation. The daily requirement for B12 is only 2 micrograms and it is the deficiency is caused by either a reduced intake or by some gastric procedures such as total gastrectomy, etc. or certain other intestinal diseases which inhibits the absorption of this from the gut such as celiac disease, tropical through fish, tape, worm, etc. And these patients will usually present with glossitis, peripheral, peripheral uritis, and subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord. Serum, the investigations to be carried out in these cases are serum B12 folic acid and red cell folate assay. Red cell folate assay is done, which actually gives you a, an indication of the folic acid deficiency being uh, more recent. The, red, the serum folate starts to reduce much later. Then a plasma homocysteine level should always be done because it increases in B12 deficiency. A methyl malonic acid rises in B12 deficiency. Then tests for B12 absorption such as pernicious anemia. Pernicious anemia is due to impaired absorption of B12 and it can be... Uh, 
in, in pernicious anemia, you will find antiparietal cell and anti intrinsic factor antibodies. We come to the normocytic normochromic anemias, which are now the hemolytic anemias. These can be intravascular or extravascular. The intravascular, the, the, the intravascular uh, hemolytic anemias can be mechanical, such as you see in microangiopathic hemolytic anemias, seen in DIC, in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpuras and hemolytic uremic syndromes and in the HELP syndrome. And sometimes they, due to other conditions such as transfusion reactions and in PNH. And the extravascular ones, intravascular is when the hemolysis is occurring inside the blood vessel and extravascular is when the hemolysis is the is when the red blood cells are destroyed in, a, in the spleen and most of the hemolytic anemias will be extravascular. They can be immune mediated, which are the autoimmune warm and cold antibody hemolytic anemias and they can also be drug infused and in some times the transfusion reaction. The intrinsic uh, RBC defects such as enzyme deficiencies, hemoglobinopathy, sickle cell disease, etc., and membrane defects such as hereditary spherocytosis all manifest as extravascular hemolytic anemias. Infections such as malaria can cause hemolytic anemias and other conditions such as hypersthenism, Wilson's disease, copper and lead poisoning, etc., can all cause hemolytic anemias in which the RBCs are all destroyed in the spleen. The, additionally, in hemolytic anemias, the defect can be intracorpuscular, that is within the RB itself, RBC itself or extracorpuscular, which is the acquired type. Mostly, the intracorpuscular will be inherited, such as hereditary spherocytosis or thalassemia, sickle cell, where the red cell itself is uh, not, uh, not normal and therefore uh, more prone to early destruction. And the extra corpuscular defects are mainly the acquired ones, such as the immune hemolytic anemias, then the fragmentation, as you see. So there is an overlap between the two classifications. But just to give you an idea that this classification can be done in both these ways. You can have fragmentation in PNH. You can have uh, hemolytic anemia infections. Non-immune mechanisms, such as some mechanical anemias like cardiac hemolytic and uh, microangiopathic hemolytic anemias and certain chemicals, drugs, infections, burns, all can cause lead poisoning, can cause hemolytic anemias. So the signs of increased red cell destruction in hemolytic anemias will be a raised serum bilirubin, raised LDH, a low serum haptoglobin and a low plasma hemopexin. And the signs of increased erythropoiesis will be raised reticulocyte count, you can see polychromasia or polychromatic macrocytes on the peripheral blood and you can see a hyperplastic bone marrow with increased erythroid hyperplasia. The diagnosis of immune hemolytic anemia is commonly done by doing the Coombs test. It is characterized by shortened red blood cell survival and a positive Coombs test. Coombs test is a simple agglutination test used to demonstrate antibodies on the RBC membrane and it is also called the direct antiglobulin test or the DAT. Now, intravascular hemolytic anemias have a specific set of uh, symptoms and findings. So, the signs that you see in intravascular hemolysis are hemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria, methemoglobinemia and hemosiderinuria. When you see these four, you must suspect that your hemolysis is intravascular and look for causes of intravascular hemolysis. So the causes of hemoglobinuria can be in acute conditions or in on chronic conditions. Acute is when you have given an incompatible blood transfusion. Immediately you will get hemoglobinuria and the plasma hemoglo hemoglobin or the hemoglobin in the urine will increase. You have uh, drugs, infections, paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, black water fever, as you see in falciparum malaria, burns, HUS, eclampsia, etc., snake and spider bites, all cause uh, intravascular hemolytic anemias. And the chronic conditions in which you see uh, intravascular hemolytic anemia are PNH, cardiac hemolytic anemias, and cold he hemagglutinin disease. So you have uh, hemolytic anemias due to red cell enzyme red cell enzyme defects such as G6PD deficiency. G6PD deficiency is a sex-linked 
uh, transmission. It protects the cell against oxidant damage. Therefore, when the G6PD is reduced, then you have the, the hemolysis. It, so normally this hemolysis you will only see after some drug intake or infections. The common drugs are anti-malarials, acetanilide, dapsone, nitrofurantoin, etc. And you can have a screening test for G6PD and you can also have a quantitative test for G6PD. The word of caution here is that when there is hemolysis, then a G6PD is not very useful because when there is increased reticulocytes, the, the reticulocytes are rich in G6PD and you may get a falsely normal G6PD in patients who actually have a reduced G6PD. Then pyruvate kinase is not commonly seen in India, and uh, but it can be diagnosed by a fluorescent spot test. Then in uh, spherocytosis, when you see on the peripheral smear, that may be due to a congenital hereditary spherocytosis or an acquired spherocytosis. Hereditary is, hereditated, is inherited as an autosomal dominant trait due to abnormalities of the membrane protein spectrum. Lab diagnosis of this is a very simple thing that you do first is on the CBC, you see that the patient has a high MCHC. It has been noticed that in hereditary spherocytosis, MCHC of the patient is high, even if the patient has an anemia an increased osmotic fragility test and a negative direct Coombs test because it is not an immune hemolytic anemia. And here you can see in the peripherals blood, many spherocytes and some polychromatic macrocytes. Osmotic fragility nowadays is also done by the flow cytometry uh, and it is a very accurate uh, test when done on the flow. You can use eosin malamide or you may not use it also. There are people who have val validated this test without using eosin mal malamide. And acquired uh, spherocytosis is seen in autoimmune hemolytic anemia and hypersplenism in post blood transfusion. And it is diagnosed by a positive direct Coombs test. And this is a typical pattern of osmotic fragility that you find when you're doing the osmotic fragility test when you treat your, uh, your uh, blood with normal saline and see when the lysis happens. You have to measure this spectrophotometrically. And here, as I told you, the MCHC is high in these cases of hereditary spherocytosis. It is a character, characteristic feature and uh, it is more than the upper limit of normal in these patients. This increased MCHC is a result of mild cellular dehydration in these patients. Then you have the paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria which is characterized by absence of GPI anchored proteins, which are the CD55 and 59. This leads to unabated complement activity and causing hemolysis in the patient. Additionally, you have a bone marrow failure in these patients and you have prothrombotic conditions also in these patients, which can be used to be diagnosed by HAMS and sucrose lysis test. But I don't know how many people still do that. We have stopped doing that because now we have a flow cytometric uh, method for very accurately predicting clones of PNH cells. And this is uh, flow cytometry by flare. Then you have a gel card also where you can, uh, you can assess the proteins, MIRL and DAF. You know, bone marrow examination, urine hemosiderin is positive in these cases. It's very necessary to accurately diagnose PNH because now there is a specific therapy, a monoclonal eclusimab for, this, for these patients. And therefore, you can, flare also helps, flow cytometry by flare also helps in monitoring these patients. Your clone, you can see your clone reducing when you give this uh, drug to the patients. So PNH is characterized by anemia, evidence of hemolysis, thrombosis, a negative Coombs test, cytopenias, a reticulocyte response which is blunted and because there is bone marrow failure in these patients. And then lastly, you have the mechanical hemolytic anemias in which the RBCs are injured by excess physical trauma and they when they circulate in the vessels. This can be in the case of artificial heart valves where the RBCs come across metal surfaces and are lysed or in microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, which is due to thrombosed vessels or fibrin strands, which are seen in DIC, TTP, etc., where 
when the red cell is trying to negotiate these blocks, it lyses. So these are the mechanical, uh, and here you typically the hallmark of the mechanical hemolytic anemia is presence of schistocytes in the peripheral blood. And there is a definition by which a cell can be called a schistocyte. But these are typical histocytes. So you can see these type of hemispheres with pointed edges are the schistocytes. And you can actually even quantitate schistocytes and uh, monitor these patients on, that, on treatment. Lastly, hypersplenism. Any condition which causes uh, uh, an enlarged spleen will cause hemolysis. Therefore, you should think of this when a patient with chronic liver disease, leukemia, lymphoma, congestive heart failure presents with anemia and a negative uh, Coombs test. Hypersplenism is characterized by pancytopenia and a hypercellular marrow. This is the hallmark of hypersplenism. The hemolytic anemia profile in our hospital that we use is a CBC with a peripheral smear examination, reticulocyte count, serum bilirubin, urobilinogen, LDH, hemoglobin, HPLC, osmotic fragility, G6PD, stool for occult blood just to rule out blood loss, anemia. Then hemoglobin in urine, hemosiderin in urine, plasma haptoglobin, plasma hemopexin, plasma hemoglobin, methemalbumin, a direct Coombs test and a test for PNH if, if warranted. So to conclude, I would say to effectively treat anemia, finding the underlying cause is very important. Taking a good history is as important. A systematic approach is needed where one by one you rule out the causes. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to do all the tests at one time. So a stepwise approach is always prudent. All parameters in the CBC are important, RDW and the newer developed param parameters like the reticulocyte hemoglobin, et cetera, are very important. Reticulocyte count, much underutilized tests must be used much more. And it can upfront, when used upfront, it can differentiate many different types of anemias. A good peripheral examination is still a must. And newer, newer parameters like the soluble transferrin receptors and red HE may play a bigger role in the future. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks a lot for a very, very informative and enlightening lecture. And I hope not only pathology postgraduates or clinical postgraduates. Many consultants must have uh, been benefited by this lecture. Thanks. So, should we take questions, ma'am, now? Ma'am, should we take questions? Yes, sure. Uh, Dr. Hari Haran is asking Can we differentiate hypersegmented neutrophils? found in vitamin B12 deficiency versus those which are found in sepsis? Uh, I, I don't know the reason for finding hypersegmented neutrophils in sepsis, uh, but I, no, I'm not aware of that. If anyone knows the answer, Abhishek, do you? Um, uh, exactly. Uh, I think may not be able to differentiate between these two types of neutrophils, but yes, one, uh, we can say that a person is identified by his or her company. So by looking at macrocytes, macroovellocytes, and toxic granules. Yeah. Associated features. Yes, ma'am, associated yeah. features. I think not, yes. We are waiting for questions, ma'am. We have one more minute. We have one more question. On what day should we use red HE as a parameter to assess response to iron therapy? The question is asked by Dr. Manali Satiza. On what day should we use red HE to, uh, to, to see the response to iron therapy? Yes, ma'am. Actually, you can use it uh, because reticulocytes are forming every day and changing every day. So basically, you, you can use it almost say within two to three days, but ideally speaking, use it after four days, four to five days. I have done many, I have monitored many patients. I know that after four to five days, it's the first parameter to increase the red HE. 
the serum iron, the uh, PIBC. I because I've done some studies and I've done all these parameters on all the days. They don't increase. The red H is the first parameter to increase. So do it after five days of, of giving oral iron. Thank you, ma'am. The next question is from Dr. Rajesh Kumar. He's asking, what are the serum ferritin and serum iron cutoff values in iron deficiency in normal persons and in patients of chronic kidney disease? See, that's the thing. There are no cutoff values as such for serum ferritin and serum iron. There, there, are, there are no cutoff values. It's only that serum iron is reduced in uh, anemia, in uh, iron deficiency anemia, whereas it is normal or increased. In, uh, therefore, these parameters don't accurately tell you or don't accurately distinguish between iron deficiency and uh, anemia of chronic disease. Therefore, to use serum ferritin and to use soluble transparent receptor assays and to use ret he gives us more idea of these conditions. And sometimes you don't find only iron deficiency and, you, and ACD, but you can even there can even be an overlap. An ACD patient may go into iron deficiency, in which case your red HE will be reduced. If the ACD patient uh, does not have an iron deficiency, the so but the anemia, but the patient will have anemia, and the the ferritin depends very much on inflammation, and all these patients have inflammation infection, so it is not very accurate in these in ACD. Dr. Hari Aran is asking one more question. Vitamin B12 deficiency, treatment, dose and duration. He's asking, uh, can you tell him what is the dose and duration for treating vitamin B12 deficiency? Vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, mainly if it, is, if it is not pernicious anemia. And if, if there's no achlorhydria or if there is no antiparietal cell antibody and there is basically if the absorption is proper, you can give oral tablets, oral uh, therapy. I don't exactly know the dose of vitamin B12, but oral tablets can be given. And if you see that there is no response to oral therapy, in that case, you will uh, give injections of uh, uh, one of either uh, Neurobion or, or any of those uh, injections. Maybe it can be better answered by Maitri. Ma'am. Yeah, uh, like for vitamin B12 deficiency, uh, uh, if we like initially till we get the report of uh, anti-parietal cell antibody or anti-intrinsic factor antibody, we start injectable only. That injectable dose is around 1000 microgram of vitamin C that will be uh, given uh, per day. This you can give intramuscular or intravenous. It can be given at home also deep intramuscular. Intramuscular injections are a little bit painful. The dictum is that you will have to give daily injection for seven days. And after that, you will have to give weekly injection for four weeks and then monthly. If it's a pernicious anemia, it will continue like that. And once you've got the report of antiparietal cell antibody or uh, this thing, anti-intrinsic factor antibody, these are negative, then as told by Dr. Shainas, then you can omit injection and start oral therapy only. And this is basically a dietary deficiency in those cases who are vegan, like strictly vegetarian yes, yes. meal product also. They suffer from this type of megaloblastic anemia. Yeah. Right, right. Thank you, Maitri. Next question is from Dr. Siaram Didel from Ames Jodhpur. He's asking, what are other probable causes for chronic hemolytic anemia in India? other than thalassemia and autoimmune hemolytic anemia in pediatric age group? What the causes of hemolytic anemia? Yes, ma'am. Chronic in hemolytic pediatric. anemia in pediatric age group other than thalassemia and AIHA. You have spherocytosis, you can have uh, uh, sickling, you can have all the, vari all the inherited disorders, mainly the... Uh, G6PD, Tachycyan. Intercorpuscular, G6PD, etc. All that, if you're giving any medication, those are the main causes in childhood that we see. Um, Dr. Harshini is asking, what are the features in blood picture with hypersplenism? Uh, hypersplenism, typically you will get a pancytopenia, have, may have enlarged spleen and you will typically get a pancytopenia with, and when you do the marrow, you will see that there is a hypercellular marrow. The typical features of hypersplenism. 
the, that we see and because many times when you do a when there's a pancytopenia and you're uh, you're thinking of an aplastic or some bone marrow failure syndrome and you do a a, a bone marrow in these patients you will get a hypercellular normal looking marrow no no abnormality seen in the marrow as such next question is again from dr siaram he is asking any method to confirm diagnosis in such rare cases possibly he is asking about chronic hemolytic anemia uh, is there any genetic panel available not really you have to ask for whatever test you are suspecting there is I, no panel as such available i don't know if any of the molecular labs are have come up with a panel for but i don't think there is we do it case as case based on the case yes, on a He's case basis yeah. asking possibly particularly about one particular case so we can discuss later dr siaram this case with ma'am next is dr shri hari is asking how common is pnh in india should we test for pnh in all non immune hemolytic anemias pnh after we started doing by flow cytometry we find that it's not still very common but there are many times when you just find no cause of the low anemia and then the patient goes into a bone marrow failure type of situation sometimes the patient can have some thrombotic uh, symptoms as well so in many of these cases we do pnh it does we it, we do get some uh, pnh very tiny clones but we do get and that is uh, good enough for the hematologists to start treatment maitri what do you think yeah like uh, my clue is that once you are suspecting a hemolytic anemia like anemia jaundice splenomegaly and your yeah. side count is uh, not proportionate to the yeah hemolysis like it's hemolysis a, yeah correct so reticulocyte with a hemoglobin of 6 gram or 5 gram so yeah. the, it is ineffective erythropoiesis plus hemolysis so when yes. two combinations are there clean yeah. Uh, you should suspect and you can screen by doing a urine hemosiderin also before yes. for a flow yes. cytometry or a ham test also though we are not doing ham test routinely yeah. uh, nowadays we used to do hams but now we stopped doing because every time you have to prepare the reagents of fresh and now yeah. that we are doing flow we don't do But like this, this is a clue that to to the students that whenever you will get a hemolytic anemia with ineffective erythropoiesis, right? You should think other clue is that if you have a low ferritin, normally in hemolytic anemia ferritin level is either normal or high. But right. in these cases, since it's intravascular hemolysis and uh, iron in the form of hemosiderin is moving out of body from uh, in urine, so in that case ferritin value is always low. So yeah. this is the clue that the your case may be a case of uh, uh, PNH. Yeah. So sometimes, like if you are normally in the habit of doing a bone marrow iron uh, stain, in that you will find that the bone marrow iron is also low in these patients. In yeah. This. So, so and so typically you can say from that also that uh, that the ferritin is low, bone marrow iron stores sto stores are low. Then you can go for a PNH test. Next question is again from Dr. Manali. She is asking about iron deficiency anemia in males. a question is should all of them be advised colonoscopy or gi workup definitely definitely all of them should be that is one thing that you cannot afford to miss it will be some either not so serious a condition or it can straight away be some gastric cancer and malignancy or it can just be some you know like celiac disease and some uh ibd etc anything but they have to go for a gastric consult if you find a uh, microcytic hypochromic anemia in a young adult male older age group is different that levels do go down in above 70 but i'm talking about 40 i mean young to to say 60 should should have a gastric consult We have no more questions. Great. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. One more question. Yeah. Doctor T R S is asking how much bone marrow iron is true value. How much bone marrow iron is true value? Uh, I don't get the question exactly, ma'am. 
normal normal is normal how much bone marrow and normally you have you have about one two is reduced zero one two is reduced and say about four onwards is normal three to four four onwards four to six is normal six is of course excess i think but again everything has to be taken into account the transfusion history yeah yeah exactly exactly that's what we have to get the history on in every case many a times what we get is a snapshot of the whole movie you have to take everything into account yeah. ma'am right so there is no more question um great matri ma'am should be uh sorry ma'am one more question dr bhavya is asking uh to is is asking to mention about significance of ldh in anemia evaluation ldh we always do in hemolytic anemias it's a marker of red cell hemolysis and it will always be raised in hemolytic anemias that is the significance of ldh sometimes we are not very sure whether it's hemolytic anemia or not and So patient is do you think it something is not responding to treatment do you want to know there is an element of hemolysis or not sometimes overlap you do an ldh it will give you an idea of whether the patient has uh, some degree of hemolysis or not of course ldh can also overlap with other situations like lymphomas etc but it is a fair as you say in the context of such a patient you can do ldh one more question ma'am when should we advise coombs test coombs test in in hemolytic anemias mostly upfront when the when there are reticulocyte count is very high and you are diagnosing a hemolytic anemia you can instantly do a coombs test to rule out an autoimmune hemolytic anemia that is one of the first tests that we do in the, in the panel for for hemolytic anemias as we do not find any more questions maybe uh, conclude matri ma'am thank you ma'am thanks a lot for just a minute just a minute abhishek the i think there are few more questions yes ma'am one more question has come ma'am should we ask for direct or indirect coombs test this is continuation to the last question A direct Coombs test. Indirect Coombs test is not relevant, very relevant for autoimmune hemolytic anemia. A direct Coombs test is more significant. The next question is: Should we check for warm and cold antibody in autoimmune hemolytic anemia? Uh, that also will depend. Sometimes for cold antibodies, you can have other clues also. You have like cold hemagglutinin disease. You will have clumping of your Uh, rbcs etc so you can say that the person has cold antibodies but uh, we usually just do a warm antibody and then we do a we can do both together also if the patient has a very high degree of hemolysis ma'am again the same uh, this question is again is bone marrow iron reflect the true value Uh, it is supposed to be the gold standard for uh, iron stores the bone marrow iron because ferritin earlier we only had ferritin and bone marrow iron and ferritin has its limitations that it is increased uh, in infections it's an acute phase reactant so they used to always say that bone marrow iron is the gold standard for iron stores in the body no more questions no more questions ma'am <laughs> finally <laughs> all right so we can yes ma'am i would uh, request to jena sir officer and matri ma'am yeah dr abhishek uh, you can conclude then if there is no more question dr jena you want to say anything dr then no, no. Uh, it was a very good uh, but many presentations by dr sanaj which i enjoyed and i learned many things also good interactions by the postgraduates i will just give few comments 
uh, some of the questions which was put, I will give some in addition. You know, the uh, GI well, still so far adult anemia is concerned. GI blood loss is one of the leading cause of anemia in adult. So you have to always look for the GI evaluation, both endoscopy, colonoscopy, and enteroscopy. If the patient is a poor, cannot afford because it is expensive in best cases, then you can treat in the lunch. Suppose you are presuming an iron deficiency anemia, treat it. If the hemoglobin does not improve as per your expectation within two weeks, then you must do the GI evaluation, the yes. form of endoscopy, colonoscopy, or dike, or even endoscope to rule out any malignancy, any tumor which we have seen in our clinical practice also. My second comment will be all about if it's autoimmune hemolytic anemia, when you are ordering the uh, Kumta direct, always you look for the, whether it is a warm antibody or cold antibody mix because the management differs accordingly. So that's a mandatory. You should look the profile of antibody and accordingly you have to categorize uh, all these things. I think these are the two comments uh, which I want to give. That's all for my side. And it was a wonderful uh, talk uh, which I enjoyed and I learned many things also. Thank you. Thank you. So over to Abhishek. Thank you, sir. So... I must thank Dr. Pati. Uh, uh, Dr. Pati is there. Yes, he can give some comment. I'm sorry, sorry, I'm muted. You did a very wonderful job. Thank you. Fast uh, talk on uh, uh, fast topic. Yeah. The anemia, the usually the we have to have to consider the primary cause or secondary. A lot of patients will have uh, secondary causes. Oh, I mean, but there has a basic primary disease itself, I will explain. So that actually is not part of this uh, topic. And obviously the ones where uh, no cause available. Yes. <laughs> Again, many conditions where uh, the one is a marrow failure. Uh, that's yes. actually a major group. Uh, needs uh, more attention in that when PNH also would come. Yes. That is a, like a separate topic in itself. Okay. This is just yeah. like an so overview. Yeah. Yeah. Such a vast topic. This is with uh, organomegaly, spinomegaly, hepatomegaly. Again, that's a, a completely different yes. uh, yes. set yes. of yes. Uh, yes. Yes. So yes. It's a very vast, I think. Uh, well, I uh, appreciate that a lot of questions. Uh, that's a good participation of the audience. And that's more important. We look forward to the uh, next talk. And yes. many people, more people join. Thank you. Dr. Yes. Abhishek, Dr. Abhishek. Hello, yes, Dr. Abhishek. Yes, sir. Thank yes, you, sir. Sir. Uh, I want to give some few more messages uh, because the relevance and importance of anemia. If you look at the incidence of anemia, it's still the commonest, the, 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 the commonest illness across the globe. And its incidence is the highest in India. Probably the Indian population, it is uh, almost 60% of the Indian population, they are anemic. And the our national productivity can be improved by more than 20% as per the WHO. It is a significant contribution for infant mortality, maternal mortality, and, and our low productivity also. And the paradoxically, in spite of our best effort by government agency, the anemia incidence is not coming down. Mm. And the most importantly, if we compare the fourth national survey and the fifth national survey, which has been published in 2021, the incidence of anime across the country has increased by 14% than the fourth one. So yes. it's a great concern for the government of India and government of India has requested to all the states uh, to go for the Anemia Mukt Bharat scheme has been initiated by government of India and he has requested all the states also to look at this matter. And I strongly believe that ISBT took a uh, piece a very strong uh, in uh, the piece uh, among all the office bearers to involve hematologists in the Naslan program which from the Indian College of Hematology, I have already informed to uh, yes. Government of India, Ministry of Health, Tribal Affairs, ICMR, all even DBT also to engage Hematology Society, ISBT, in planning and educating the national programs, how to uh, combat, how to prevent this high incidence of anemia. That's the over. Over to Abhishek. Thank you, sir. So, I must thank organizers, Office bearers of ISHBT and ma'am, Shana's ma'am, for 
organizing and giving a wonderful uh, lecture i think before we conclude i i want to thank obishek for a uh, very well conduction of this uh, session and giving us the time so thank you obishek maybe in future also again we will call you uh, this is uh, like you this session is totally dedicated for the students and a request for the students is that please feel free whatever doubt you have you can ask question so we are ready to answer your question here yeah? participate and uh, clear your doubts and obishek can you give us the uh, what will be the next uh, class here yeah. so next class will be on the iron deficiency anemia its diagnosis and treatment and it will be de delivered by professor manoranjan mahapatra from department of hematology all india institute of medical sciences new delhi and that is on march 23 2022 the time will be same that is 7 pm and we look forward to the next master class thank you you all all the participants for joining today's master class thank you thank you thank you thank you everyone